I was shook. The paradox between free will and destiny. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 meta movies. Can I get a selfie? Sure, yeah, oh, no, I like shit. that movie too. Yeah, you did so uh, good in that movie, man. For this list, we'll be looking at the most notable films that are self-referential, self-aware, or which parody their own existence. Some plot points will be discussed, so beware of potential spoilers ahead. Which of these movies did you find the most clever? Let us know in the comments below. Number 20, being John Malkovich. Only Charlie Kaufman could write a movie as brilliantly gonzo as this one. The story follows Craig Schwartz, a file clerk whose life changes after discovering a portal into John Malkovich's mind. There's a tiny door in my office, Maxine. It's a portal and it takes you inside John Malkovich. As the title suggests, the people who traverse this portal are able to become John Malkovich for a brief period. The movie is chock full of wonderful appearances from A-list actors, and Malkovich stars as a somewhat warped version of himself. The script not only asks important existential questions, it also pokes fun at Malkovich's supposed lack of fame, as nobody can probably recall a film of his. Thanks to this movie, we don't think anyone will have that problem in real life. Oh yeah, what's he been in? Lots of things. Uh, that Jewel Thief movie, for example, he, he's very well respected. Number 19, Existence. Forget the goofy spelling of the title, Existence is quite an effective showing from the master of body horror, David Cronenberg. Jennifer Jason Leigh plays a video game designer named Allegra, who is hunted by killers inside her own VR game. As she's the mind behind the game, Allegra is constantly making observations about its machinations and creations. Michael, he was only a game character. In this way, the script itself is also discussing what the film is doing. It's a very strange story that may take multiple viewings to understand, but when it all clicks, it becomes clear that Existence is one of Cronenberg's smartest movies. You'll get used to it. There are things that have to be said to advance the plot and establish the characters, and those things get said whether you want to say them or not. Don't fight it. Number 18, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. With this movie, it seemed like Kevin Smith was poking fun at the mega Hollywood machine, which he had become well entrenched in since Clerks. The titular duo learned that Miramax Films plans to release a Blunt Man and Chronic movie. Well, that was just another pin a male adolescence and its refusal to grow up. Yes, sis, but it was better than mall rats. To receive their due royalties, they embark on a trip to Hollywood. The movie is filled with references, many of which are to Smith's past works, as it takes place in his so-called View Askewniverse. It's also intentionally pandering to fan service, as Jay and Silent Bob were quite popular in Smith's other movies. The film even features the pair taking on their critics, almost as if to get a leg up on its own critical reception. Remind me to renew that restraining order. Why? Because I am going to blast that flick on the internet tonight. Number 17, Blazing Saddles. Mel Brooks is one of the all-time greatest movie directors and a master of the meta comedy. Many people love the wickedly smart Spaceballs, and for good reason. How can there be a cassette of Spaceballs the movie? We're still in the middle of making it. Oh, that's true, sir. But there's been a new breakthrough in home video marketing. Yes, yes. Instant cassettes. But his masterpiece is arguably Blazing Saddles. The recipient of three Oscar nominations, and now conserved in the National Film Registry, it's one of the greatest parodies ever made. The film expertly pokes fun at westerns and gets extremely meta in the final act. The characters do away with the fourth wall as they fight, eventually flocking to the streets of Burbank before taking the action to Grauman's Chinese Theatre. What happens from there is a bit of pure movie-making magic, and it showcases Brooks's boundless imagination. Well, what do you want to do now? Come on, let's check out the end of the flick. Yeah. Gee, I sure hope there's a happy ending. I love a happy ending. Number 16, Birdman. Regarded as one of the best films of 2014, Alejandro González Iñárritu's Birdman was also among the most clever. In many ways, it's a reflection on the entertainment industry and those that populate it, including its own stars. For one thing, Michael Keaton portrays an actor who was once popular for bringing a fictional superhero to life, but is now past his prime. And that's 
Face it, Dad, you are not doing this for the sake of art. You are doing this because you want to feel relevant again. We wouldn't call the old Batman washed up, but he had certainly fallen off by the time Birdman was released. Furthermore, some people have drawn parallels between Edward Norton's difficult character and the actor's reputation as a perfectionist. And finally, there's the whole play within a movie thing, which touches upon the creative process and the personal meanings behind certain story elements. Jimmy, uh, uh, Woody Harrelson. He's doing the next Hunger Games. Um, uh, Michael Fessbender. He's doing the prequel to the X-Men prequel. How about uh, uh, Jeremy Renner? Who? Number 15, Shaun of the Dead. Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg love them some self-aware flicks. While Hot Fuzz hilariously sends up the buddy cop genre, Shaun of the Dead does something similar with zombies. A comedy with loving knowledge of the genre, it works astoundingly well as a straightforward zombie movie and a hilarious deconstruction. Can't see any. Maybe it's not as bad as all that. Oh, no, there they are. For one thing, characters discuss the bizarre behaviour of the undead, initially not realising what they're actually dealing with. And in a great gag, Sean tells Ed not to use the word zombie, a hilarious nod to how the creatures are seldom actually called zombies in movies. Sean of the Dead might not be far off when it comes to depicting what would actually happen if regular people were faced with a zombie outbreak. Take car, go to mum's, kill Phil, sorry, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint and wait for all this to blow over. Number 14, The Truman Show. Written by Andrew Nichol, The Truman Show is a fascinating movie about the very practice of watching television. At the time, it was known for being one of Jim Carrey's first serious bits of acting, and the Oscar-nominated directing and writing gave him a lot to play with. Carrey is Truman Burbank, a guy who eventually realises that he is the subject of a TV show and that everyone around him, even his wife, are actually actors. All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? Who are you talking to? The entire movie is about the creative process. The director, the stars, and even the set designers who keep things looking realistic. It's also about the process of consuming television, specifically manufactured reality TV, where the stars are real people being observed for entertainment. Then who am I? You're the star. Number 13, This Is The End. It doesn't get much more meta than This Is The End. The hilarious apocalyptic movie from Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg follows the vain celebrities of Rogen's inner circle while they deal with the end of the world. The actors technically play themselves, but with fake over-the-top nonsensical personas. It's like the golfing sequence in Navy SEALs. Sick reference though, bro. Oh, thanks, bro. Dude, your references are out of control. Everyone knows that. They even use real issues and developments as starting off points for commentary or jokes. For example, Rogan and Jay Baruchel fight over the different paths they took, and Jonah Hill can't help but mention his appearance in Moneyball. The film is also filmed with appearances from notable celebrities, including Rihanna, Paul Rudd, and Emma Watson. It's a hilarious offering that allows Rogan and his friends to mock themselves for a hundred plus joyful minutes. <laughs> yes! What's up, man? Seth! So happy you're here! Hey, Johnny, what's up? Hey, it's a change. Number 12, The Cabin in the Woods. Drew Goddard's meta-comedy has its finger firmly on the pulse of the horror genre. It honours decades worth of tropes, character and villain types and death styles, all while telling a highly unique story. A small crew of youth get stuck in and around the titular cabin in the woods, which is completely controlled by an underground facility. Does it really matter if we see We're not the only ones watching, Ken. Gotta keep the customer satisfied. The lab employees place wages on how their subjects will die and by whose hands, and they control the inhabitants' behaviours through various invasive means. All the genre's classic elements are satirised, and it culminates in a bloody climax that will not be forgotten anytime soon. You can die with them, or you can die for them. 
Number 11, I'm Still Here. A surreal work of experimentation, I'm Still Here, is arguably one of Joaquin Phoenix's strangest films. Serving as a mockumentary, it stars Phoenix as himself as he leaves acting behind to become a rapper. I really want it to be like a hip hop bohemian rhapsody kind of thing, you know? I want it to be epic. It's a hilarious premise, and the actor certainly milked it for all it was worth. In fact, he took the concept beyond the movie itself and seemingly applied it to real life. In the meta-ist of all meta moves, Phoenix adopted his character's persona for talk show appearances and other press stints, leading many to wonder if he was okay. But there was no need to be worried. It was all just a bit of fun. Life's a journey that goes round and round, and the end is closest to the beginning. So if it's change you need, relish the journey. Number 10, Tropic Thunder. We love when Hollywood mocks itself, and Tropic Thunder is arguably one of the best and funniest examples. It works as a straightforward action movie, it works as an affectionate spoof of war films, and it works as a metafictional comment on the entertainment industry and the celebrities who inhabit it. I think I might be nobody. Wow! The insecurity level with you guys is ridiculous! Talk about having layers. The story is about the painful process of making a movie and dealing with the egotistical actors that make the operation difficult. It certainly seemed like the writers, which included director Ben Stiller, had a lot of thoughts about the dramatic undertaking of filmmaking. They let them all out in hilarious fashion with Tropic Thunder. Put on your war faces, gentlemen. Now, let's go and make the greatest war movie ever! Number 9, Stranger Than Fiction. This movie shares much in common with The Truman Show. Like it, Stranger Than Fiction is about a man who learns that he is nothing but a character in a story. Little did he know that this simple, seemingly innocuous act would result in his imminent death. What? And, like The Truman Show, it stars a comedic actor in a serious role. Will Ferrell is lonely IRS employee Harold Crick, who can suddenly hear his experiences being narrated. The narrator's voice belongs to novel writer Karen Eiffel, who it appears has created Harold as a character and now plans on killing him off. It's a fascinating movie that comments on the storytelling process by using its protagonist as a character in a tale. This may sound like gibberish to you, but uh, I think I'm in a tragedy. Number 8. Funny Games Mikael Honecker's Funny Games is arguably one of the most fearless works ever made. Its violent content has disturbed many, and it blatantly plays with the conventions of film. What do you mean? Denken Sie, Sie haben eine Chance zu gewinnen? Sie sind doch auf Ihrer Seite, oder? Also, auf ihn setzen Sie. We expect movies to begin and end in a straightforward manner, and we collectively pretend that what we're watching is real. But some movies say, no, I'm not going to do that. And Funny Games is one of them. In the controversial climax, one of the villains literally rewinds the movie to prevent the death of his sadistic partner. They then use this new ultimate timeline to kill the surviving protagonists. It was an incredibly gutsy move from Hanukkah, and its merits are still being debated and analysed. What do you mean, Has du schon genug, or willst du weiter spielen? Number 7, Shadow of the Vampire. Just one year after the release of Being John Malkovich, we got to see the titular actor in another brilliantly self-reflective movie. Shadow of the Vampire depicts well-known silent film Nosferatu's creation. Malkovich plays the director F.W. Murnau, and the fantastic Willem Dafoe plays Max Schreck, the actor who famously portrayed Count Orlok. It's incredible, no? I wish you could all see your faces. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Max Schreck, who will be portraying our vampire Count Orlok. But it's not that simple. This is a fictional retelling of a historic event, and it adds a fun little twist to the proceedings. You see, Max Schreck is really a vampire, and he starts killing his fellow actors and filmmakers. It honours the history of a classic movie, it serves as a vampire film, and it's a brilliant satire about the movie-making process. This script girl, I'll eat her later.
Number 6, 22 Jump Street We thought 21 Jump Street was meta, but we hadn't seen anything yet. 22 Jump Street did everything that its predecessor did, but ramped it all up. Like the first, it spoofed both school and buddy cop movies. And like the first, it constantly laughs at its own existence. So now this department has invested a lot of money to make sure Jump Street keeps going. We've doubled their budget. As if spending twice the money guaranteed twice the profit. Whereas the 2012 movie made fun of its identity as a needless reboot of an old franchise, this one makes fun of its identity as a sequel. Phil Lord and Christopher Miller are some of the smartest and funniest modern filmmakers around, and 22 Jump Street is a hilarious metafictional wink at the nature of sequels. But seriously, when is 29 Jump Street Sunday School with Seth Rogen coming? Crap, does Schmidt look any different to you? No, that's Schmidt. I don't know what you're talking about, man. He look exactly the same to me. I got new glasses. Yeah, man, he just got some new glasses, man. Goddamn. Number five, Sunset Boulevard. Aside from being one of the greatest noirs ever made, Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard is also a fantastic bit of metafiction. Many Hollywood bigwigs make cameos as themselves, including Cecil B. DeMille, Sidney Skolsky, and Buster Keaton. The story is also about the ruthless world of Hollywood and the general skeeziness within it, especially back then. Apparently I just didn't have what it takes. And the time had come to wrap up the whole Hollywood deal and go home. But the most meta of all is the inclusion of Gloria Swanson. She plays an aging and irrelevant silent film star named Norma Desmond, who is struggling in the era of sound films. This was a genius bit of casting, as Swanson herself was a forgotten silent film star who had a harder time during the sound era. The exquisite performance earned Swanson her third and final Oscar nomination. There's nothing else. Just us cameras and those wonderful people out there in the dark. Number 4. Adaptation For adaptation, screenwriter Charlie Kaufman reunited with director Spike Jones following their highly acclaimed flick being John Malkovich. A metafictional film about Kaufman's own life, Adaptation, concerns the time he tried bringing Susan Orlean's The Orchid Thief to the big screen. Who's gonna play me? Oh, well, I've got to write the book first, John, and then, you know, if they get somebody to write the screenplay. Hey, I think I should play me. <laughs> Kaufman writes himself as the main character, and both he and his fictional twin are brought to life by Nicolas Cage. Meryl Streep also stars as Orlean. The movie genuinely weaves in parts of The Orchid Thief while integrating Kaufman into the story, and speaking about the screenwriting process in self-aware ways. Are you confused? Well, good. That's the point. I want to show that Orly never saw the blooming ghost orchid. It was about disappointment. Number 3. Last Action Hero This movie came out in 1993, when the 80s were still relatively fresh in people's minds. That decade was arguably among Hollywood's most extravagant and bombastic ones, at least when it comes to action flicks. And here was one of the biggest stars of said decade, Arnold Schwarzenegger, poking fun at it all. You've seen those movies where they say, make my day, or I'm your worst nightmare. Well, listen to this one, rubber baby buggy bumpers. You didn't know I'm gonna say that, did you? Schwarzenegger plays Jack Slater, a popular and fictional action character. Young Danny Madigan lives in the real world. That is, until he finds himself in Slater's universe. The movie is full of biting satire that parodies the genre, and more than a few jokes are directly made at Schwarzenegger's expense. Last Action Hero is a nod to 80s action cinema that also happens to laugh at it. You think you're funny, don't you? I know I am. I'm the famous comedian Arnold Braunschweiger. Number 2. Deadpool It's easy to see why Deadpool became such a phenomenon. You know, aside from Ryan Reynolds' charisma. At a time when some people were getting a little tired of superhero flicks, it swooped in, ready to ridicule the whole thing. Anyway, I got places to be, a face to fix, and oh, bad guys to kill. Deadpool himself often speaks directly to the audience, and his snarky personality is perfectly satirical. The movie playfully parodies the genre's countless tropes and directly references its most prominent releases. This includes a cute little gag about getting the actors and timelines of X-Men mixed up. Let us go talk to the professor. McAvoy or Stewart, these timelines are so confusing. 
It's like Deadpool is aware that he is a character within a movie, and he's fully on board with lampooning the world that he inhabits. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Scream Franchise There are self-reflective movies, and then there are the Scream movies. Every single one of them is metafictional to some degree, and every single one parodies the conventions of their respective entries. Scream dismantles the slasher genre, while Scream 2 references the tropes of horror sequels, and even makes fun of itself as an inferior entry. Are you suggesting that someone's trying to make a real-life sequel? Stab 2? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. No, wow. Wow. come on, man. Oh, please, please. By definition alone, they're inferior films. Scream 3, for its part, talks about trilogies and wrapping up long-running storylines. Then there's Scream 4, which is all about new eras and characters. And 2022's Scream spoofs the exhausting nature of legacy sequels, with Scream 6 going full-blown franchise. Basically, every installment has something fun and original to say about the horror genre, and each is written with heaping amounts of self-awareness. There's simply no other series like it. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.